Welcome. How many have been to a SCORE workshop before? Okay, so many haven't. My job is the easy job tonight. I get to introduce you to SCORE. If you haven't met, uh, uh, if you haven't met SCORE with SCORE before, tell you a little bit about our organization. And then uh, Dr. Smith is going to take it from there and, and uh, lead our workshop on leadership and management. So I get to do two slides. The first one says, welcome. Okay. Now, many people know SCORE as, uh, as an organization that's a volunteer organization whose mission it is is to help small business. That's, that's our purpose. Uh, and uh, the, it used to be an acronym standing for Senior Core of Retired Executives, SCORE. Uh, but it isn't anymore because we're all working longer and living longer, thank goodness. So, uh, so many of us do have uh, uh, otherwise employed. Uh, but the thing that's still true is that it's all volunteer. Everything about it's volunteer. There are 400 chapters around the country. There is a national organization. Uh, we are, as a national organization, we are affiliated with the Small Business Administration. If you think about it, they guarantee loans for small business and they want to make sure their loans as best as possible get repaid. And so they like to have some uh, business counseling for their clients. And that's where we come in. We get credit for that, so, uh, so we're glad you're here because uh, you give us uh, uh, indirectly funding to, uh, to be here. Um, but um, in addition to doing these workshops, we also have counseling where we provide counseling services uh, to clients. It's a no charge service. Some people uh, come and the first thing I try to do is is reassure them that they don't have to get every issue they have out on the table and discussed in that one session. That we actually, it's a gateway session. We're just creating a doorway to see if there's an interest in on both sides parties, both parties sides to continue the dialogue and create a relationship. So some of our relationships with our SCORE clients uh, go for, uh, you know, as long as necessary. Sometimes it's uh, months and uh, a few are ongoing for years. In addition to providing counseling services to the workshops, we also work with existing small businesses that are trying to get from one level to the next level so they can go away on vacation and the business can keep running. So to institutionalize a business, we provide mentoring services and that's a much that's a very different kind of thing than counseling, uh, mentoring, uh, helping uh, small business people uh, be able to delegate, be able to structure, uh, create policies and procedures, and most importantly, to grow personally. And that's what mentoring is about. Half our business are startups and half are existing businesses. The Akron office of SCORE is responsible for four counties. And the, the office itself is, uh, is re has been up for chapter of the year for the last several years. We haven't gotten it, but we're up for it. Top three in, out of 400 around the country. That's pretty good. And there's a couple reasons for that. We're very dynamic. We have almost 70 counselors. It says 60. We actually have 68 now. It keeps changing. I joined uh, not quite three years ago. We had 43 counselors. So we are expanding quickly, expanding into different, uh, in, uh, uh, into each of the counties that we have and, and uh, responsibility for. We now have physical sites at Kent State, Wayne College, Medina. Um, so we. Uh, we are out uh, here. We do counseling in the library here. So we're available for you. And that's what I wanted to tell you about SCORE. And the bottom line is really important is that, is that everything that we do with our clients is confidential. So uh, you, that's an important thing for most of our clients, especially for small business because the nature of a small, of a small businessman his personal life and his business life are very interwoven, unlike the, the corporate guy. Okay, now, it, before we get started, I have uh, just one question to ask, and I'm just kind of curious about this. How many people work 
uh, in, an, in an office where there's more than just you and a couple of other people? Okay. And how many is just you and a couple of other people? Okay, so I, I, I figured that's about nine hands that went up. Now, I'm not sure what the other options are. All right, let's do that again. How many people work in an office where there's, you know, their company, in a company where there's more than just a, a few people? Okay, I'm trying to get the dynamics of, of, the, of how many are involved in interpersonal relationships that are integral to the success of the organization. Thank you for raising your hands. I appreciate that. Okay. Dr. Smith is a foremost expert on this topic. He is, he is Professor Emeritus at Kent State University. And so um, I'm delighted to be working with, uh, with Bob. And here he is, Dr. Smith. Oh, you have this one. So I don't have to hold this <coughs> all the time. Emeritus sounds like a disease, Tom. <laughs> It's really emeritus. I don't know. My voice is pretty loud without it. Is it on now? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I uh, am almost retired from Kent State, having worked there since 1968. Prior to that, I was at Penn State for a few years where I got a degree in management. and. Uh, when I got to Kent, I said, gosh, now I can get out and work in business. So I spent about 25 years uh, teaching managers at Goodyear. Uh, one day a week, the university encouraged us to learn about the real world. And during those years at Kent, I had the privilege of having uh, taught in South Africa, in Puerto Rico, Mexico, and uh, for Goodyear throughout Europe. So I think I have some background. I have a very small business now of my own. Um, for Tom's sake, uh, two people. and. Uh, it's uh, very hard to run a business with uh, two people, much less 50 or 1,000 or 55,000, such as at Goodyear. So the work tonight that we're going to be doing has to do with uh, the topic of management. And that's one of the reasons uh, Tom was uh, asking that question. We designed this program for people that had people working with them and for them. Sometimes in a small business, it's one person. So sometimes when we use the word management, uh, it was designed as a sort of a, a course beyond our basic workshop, which gets you started. It uh, helps you write a business plan. It's very, very important that uh, anybody that wants to have a business have a business plan. And SCORE's expertise in, in business planning is outstanding. And we thought, well, once you get your business started, it would be nice to have a second level course. And that's what this course was intended to be. However, we've redesigned it because we're never quite sure who's going to show up for the seminars. Because sometimes people just like to go to workshops and learn new things. Sometimes managers want to learn how to do better at management. But the thing I want to stress is that there's a huge difference between being a manager and being a leader. And I like to say that today, in this world of ours, America is overmanaged and underled. So, what do you think, if you were trying to bring up some words that define a leader, what would you, uh, what would some words be? <clears throat> They're already there, so you can cheat and... Example. Sets the example. Inspirational. There's been uh, some research on leadership, and I've read a lot and, and written a number of articles for the Beacon Journal on the topic. And uh, so I've read a lot recently. And the current issue of Business Week, which I want to quote from, and it has to do with uh, our new leader in Washington, uh, Mr. Obama. Uh, this was written by Jack Welch. He used to be the CEO and leader, in my opinion, at General Electric. And uh, his comments about Obama are, are very, very, I think, enlightening. He starts, the president has articulated his goals to the nation. Articulated over and over in different ways. Articulated. Vision, though, is meaningless alone. To be an effective leader, 
you must communicate consistently, vividly, and to dare frequently that your thrust gets home. You can't, as we've seen, communicate too much, especially when you're trying to make change happen. Every time he speaks, which is often, he's thoughtful, expansive, and candid. Candid being honest. And uh, that's one of the reasons he's probably in, in office in many political sense. I don't want to get political, but we didn't always trust what the Washington was telling us in the past. Uh, that's critical. All the research indicates the number one trait, and I think it's on your list, is integrity for leadership. Honesty, integrity, inspiration, competence, and a vision. Those were the four that came out of some 200 items when people around the world were asked, what do you look for in your leader? Number one, with the students at Kent State, freshmen, MBAs, which I worked with, PhDs that I also worked with, the people at Goodyear, number one on their list of what they look for in a leader is honesty. And if you lose it, you lose their trust, you, you've finished. You can be a manager, but you can't be a leader if you're not honest. So the, the, the thing that we try to stress with the students over the years and with any seminar that we offer is that walk the talk, speak what you mean, and mean what you say. So that uh, kind of separates the leaders from the managers. I will add this, that uh, the rest of the article by Welsh says that uh, he's probably going to be known as the next great orator, Mr. Obama, the next great orator, able to speak able to convince people of a message, and able to hopefully get things done. Now, I have to say this on his behalf, Welsh didn't agree with his, doesn't agree with his policies, but he agrees that he's an outstanding speaker, and he can persuade people to his point of view. So that's something that maybe you can think about if you want to become a leader. Toastmasters is wonderful. If you've ever gone to Toastmasters, anybody ever go to Toastmasters? Isn't that a great thing for people that if, why was it helpful to you? I think from the standpoint, just to gain that confidence, get on your feet, have somebody point out to you, so you think about such and such, and you've got a right for a second, and something looks like you've been planning this presentation. I think one of the greatest fears of people is to getting up in front of a strange group and, and speaking. Well, I d did it for years, everywhere in the world almost, so I, I feel more comfortable than most people would feel in front of a group that, uh, that they don't know. So Toastmasters helps you to get over that. Toastmaster, good thing to do. I just want to recommend that if speaking is part of what you want to do, to be able to persuade others, your spouse, your children, your employees, your friends down the street, uh, communication skill is absolutely the, the most essential skill. I, I call it the most important of all human skills is the ability to communicate. So that's where we're headed tonight. Which is more important, the leader or the manager? They're different. Managers plan, they organize, they budget, they control, they write policy. Leaders have that vision, that competence, that skill to motivate and all the things that it takes to get people excited about their job. Which is more important? Well, let's take a, let's take a crack at that. I think this is all in your notes, but the manager does it, he's an administrator. But keep in mind that the manager is given followers. The leader earns followers. And without followers, you can't lead. You can manage, but you can't lead. You maintain. You pay them. You educate. You make sure they show up on time. The leader develops, tries to make people grow beyond what their natural skills are. The notion of control and manipulation, keeping things in line, it's absolutely essential. The leader trusts. More short range, bottom line in this country, it's quarter by quarter for the stock, stock market. Long range thinking, that's the vision that uh, Obama is trying to convince us of. I think it's a longer range thinking. Don't get excited, folks, if everything doesn't change this year. Uh, gotta watch the bottom line. That's what we're paid to do in a capitalistic system. Uh, we keep our eye more out on the horizon as opposed to heads down thinking. We imitate what others are doing. Yes, too much sometimes. <clears throat> we originate. 
as a leader, this is an interesting dichotomy. The manager does things right. And if you're working for that person, you better do things right, or you won't have a job. The leader does the right things. It's a difference between being efficient, which is doing things right, and being effective, which is doing the right thing. Now, that's more than a play on words. I think that's absolutely essential when you think about, do you want to be a leader? Do you want to be a follower? There's some myths about leadership, and we don't have a PowerPoint on that, but I'd like to tell you some of the things we think about leadership that aren't true anymore. It used to be thought that leaders were born and not made. All the research indicates that if you learn the right skills, you will be more effective at being a leader. You can develop leadership skills. It helps if you had good parents that helped you make, or that allowed you to make decisions and supported you when you made those decisions. That helps a lot in leadership. But you can learn at any age, I believe, and the research would indicate, that you can be more effective at a leadership capacity. Now, another myth, M-Y-T-H, about leadership is that it exists at the top. This person up here is responsible for everything. We blame George Bush for everything wrong in this country. Well, he's the leader. We're supposed to be. No, leadership exists at every level. Within the employee level, you have informal leaders, the people you want to be your foreman. Those are the people that you want to move into leadership and supervisory responsibility. They get along, and they lead, and they have vision, and they have friends, and they can make decisions when they're needed. So leadership exists at all levels in the organization. Everybody can be a leader. Anybody can be a leader. You have followers, you will be a leader. A manager will be given followers. Uh, a manager would delegate responsibility to others. Now, this is an academic kind of dichotomy here. Uh, a leader empowers. Does anyone in the audience have any foggy notion the difference between delegating and empowering? Remember, I was a school teacher for 44 years. <laughs> and I, did, I didn't allow students to go to sleep, and this is what I did. I kind of walked around, and if this were a class, I'd say, what's the difference? And you'd say, I don't know. Don't give it darn. I don't care. Hi, George. Good to see you. Anybody want to take a crack at it? I, here we go. and let them, let them do it. Exactly. The delegator will kind of watch. Uh, sometimes we call it micromanaging. Uh, yeah, I think you can do it, Charlie, but I'm going to be around. I'll be watching. That's sort of feeling that, that people get. But a person that empowers somebody else teaches them, gives them clear instructions, supports them, but lets them make their own decisions. And if they screw up, well, they'll hear about it. But uh, every now and then, we all screw up, don't we? All right. Uh, it's pretty hard to do artwork if it's any good with, power, with uh, PowerPoint uh, abilities. But I'd like you to think about leadership and management as sort of a bicycle. Now, I have to give credit where this came from. And once I tell you where it came from, you'll probably discard it immediately. This was uh, shown, a better picture, shown at a executive conference in Detroit at General Motors. That's, that's, that's where this comes from. All right, uh, I did my write on copyrights. But um, riding a bicycle requires two wheels, a front wheel that guides it and a rear wheel that drives it. Now, I think what we could put in there, let me see if I can do this. Uh, this will show. Oops. Blank. In that rear wheel were things like production, marketing, human resources, and accounting, and finance, and so forth. The driving forces, the business functional areas. You can't have a business in our society without good functional drivers. The guiding wheel, the, the, the idea that you have creative teams that make honest decisions and understand that everybody's not the same, called diversity management, uh, guides it. Now, at General Motors, when I sat in on this presentation, the presenter said, which wheel on the 
bicycle is the more important wheel, the one that guides it or the one that drives it. See, this is one of those questions you don't want to take a chance with because no matter which, which wheel you pick, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> They're both the same. And, and to have a bicycle and to ride a bicycle, even after 20 years of hanging in the garage, you can get on it and pretty well ride a bicycle again. Anybody ever try to ride a unicycle? Bob, is it easy? No. Could you do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a herky-jerky, and if you keep your balance, it's, it's doable. But the point this professor was trying to, or the speaker was trying to make, was that some, some people in management, some people in management kind of get back locked into their, their production or their marketing or their accounting, and they don't think much about this. And they, they're good drivers, but they're not very good guiders. So to have an effective organization, it's better to think of it an analogy of a bicycle rather than a unicycle. There are people that get too locked in with team building and quality and ethical decision, and they forget about the fact that, hey, we got a business to run. So management and leadership, if you want to look at it this way, you have the rear wheel being more management oriented and the front wheel being more leadership oriented, but a bicycle is a bicycle. We would like to have good leaders who are also good managers. So the manager has values, has his own personal motivation and ability, and of course there's a vision and there's goals and there's mission and, and that kind of stuff. All right, so we're leading it, well, holding this wheels together, the structure, we've, la we've labeled it there as a communication uh, structure, uh, the framework that holds it together is communication. Now that might be a little bit of a stretch, but we're, remember, we're using our imagination to try to come up in our minds with something that's useful. By the way, what we look for in a SCORE workshop is that you can leave tonight with something useful, but everybody should take something maybe different. Each person is in the audience is different. Each person has different values and goals and a walk in life and so forth. So we don't expect you to pass a quiz until just a little bit later. Then we're going to ask you to take a quiz. And, and, and if you don't get the right answers, we start all the way back at the beginning and go through it again. Keep in mind, now 44 years of teaching, you've got to have quizzes in here someplace. But in, in, all, in all fairness, uh, everybody should go out of here with two or three ideas that they can make use of. And what we're going to do coming up in the next few minutes, actually a few hours. Well, we'll be out of here by 9.30 or so. No, 8.30, quarter to nine. But anyway, during the next hour, we'd like to present material that you can use at your home, at your work, and with your friends. Because communication is something that we do everywhere, not just at work. So, what is this thing, holding the two wheels of the bike together? Transfer of intended meaning between a sender and a receiver. Now that's a textbook definition out of University of Michigan, and uh, the band's name was Burlo. Somehow in my head, I've got some ideas, and uh, somehow I have to plant them so that you will understand them in your head. How does it happen? Well, at this point, I'm a sender. I put my thoughts right now into words. That's called encoding. Guess what? The 500 words used most often in the English language have 28,000 different meanings, 14,000 different meanings. Somebody took the time to figure that out. The 500 words in the English language that are used most often have absolutely un on average, 28 different meanings. Now, if I were to, this is your first test. If I pick out one of the 500 most common words, which I like to do, I, I like to pick out the word sharp. Just sharp. What comes to your mind? Dress sharp. Dress. Dress. 
A what? An instrument. An instrument. Any particular kind of an instrument. A knife. a knife. Any particular kind of a knife. Scalpel. Scalpel. Uh, you ever work in a hospital? No. No. <laughs> Okay, sharp intelligence. You were going to say the same thing? Uh, describing the curve is when it goes around. Sharp very, turn. Very uh, abrupt. Curve, abrupt. yeah. What Tom had to do to dodge that deer the other night, coming back from Worcester, right? He had to make a sharp curve <laughs> in that steering wheel. Sharp. What's the question? There's a question. A question, yes. What is the question? Question. What is the question? What is the definition, or what word comes to your mind when you hear the word sharp? Hurt. 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 Edge. Now, you would, you would get hurt if you cut yourself with an edge, something that was very sharp, like a razor blade or something. Sharp? I don't mind sharp. What would an accountant, how would an accountant respond to this question? A pen or a pencil because that's an instrument that you use. How might a hunter respond? A hunter, somebody that goes hunting. A blade, a knife, maybe a hunting knife. How about the chef over here at the view? What, what, what the chef might think of? A cleaver, something to chop meat, yes. Cheese, you from Wisconsin? Okay, uh, somebody from Wisconsin might think of a, a sharp cheddar cheese or something like cheese, sharp taste. So we can go around the room and we can play this little game, but I bet we've already got 14 of the 28. What's the message I'm trying to get through? Words alone can't do it. The 500 we use most often can be interpreted in so many, many different ways. If I was a, uh, a surgeon, I would think maybe of a scalpel. But if I was a nurse, what might I think of immediately? <coughs> needle. needle. Yeah, the nurses, more needles. The doctors, more scalpels and so forth. If I was a musician, musician. Higher. Lower and higher notes, that, that thing that goes on a scale, on a staff, in a, in a, a musical score. Well dressed, yes. Fashion design, Kent State University, great program. Uh, that's a that's a plug. I'm sorry. That's what it <laughs> so once I have this thought and I use words that have many many different meanings, the words we use so often and frequently, I, it, it's time to transmit to you, the receiver. Now, what is the receiver going to do with those words? Not yet. Not yet, but that's, that's in the list. Okay, so, okay, we're assuming that you can hear, and the words are coming in. You decode. Now, well, the context does matter, absolutely. You relate them to other words in the sense. I'm just kind of playing a little bit now with the fact that our English language has many, many different ways of toying with the words we use. So you would decode, and then you interpret. Now, the message is the message received. Think about that. That's a good bumper sticker. I like to give little things that make a difference. <laughs> Maybe if you write it down. The message is the message received, not necessarily the message that is sent. And what we lack in this drawing, which is in the, the Michigan drawing, is something that goes from the interpretation back to the communicator, and that is by definition called feedback. Thank you. Feedback. Now, why are we laboring this point? Communication, the most important skill. Managers spend up to 90% of their work life in some form of communication. 
And I suspect we as ordinary human beings with necessarily not managing, we spend at least half our time in some form of communication. Guess what we teach in our schools? In terms of communication, what do we teach? Well, how does a child learn? First, they, they learn to hear or listen. Then they learn to speak. Then they learn to read and then write. And we teach all that stuff in schools. Reading, writing, maybe some speaking. Maybe some speaking. Guess what we spend most of our time doing? And we think because we have two ears, we do it very well. Listen. Listening. So we're going to spend just a couple moments about listening tonight in a little bit. But my own opinion, the intelligent designer that came up with us, human <laughs> beings, notice I said intelligent design. I'm giving away a little bit of my value system. But he gave or she gave us two ears and one mouth. Maybe in this intelligent design, there was an implicit message, folks, that we should spend more time listening and less time talking. <sighs> Teach that to a professor. <laughs> we don't enough. Parents, teachers, managers, friends, listening. The message is the message received. It may not be the message that is sent. Think about what's going on in our workaday world these days, home and work. How are we communicating? How are we communicating? Electronically. Electronically. Email. Texting. Texting while we're driving, hopefully not on our laps, with Bluetooth in our ear. We are communicating constantly in some form, but it's generally electronic. Keep that point in mind for just a moment. So another bumper sticker here. Most of the time, we don't communicate based on this definition. What do we do? We just take turns talking. Play on words. Academic. Professorial. We don't communicate most of the time. We take turns talking. Now, here's another statistic that isn't on the chart here. How fast, what's my rate of speech? Is that in the notes? How did you know that? See, you put a ringer in the class here. Yes, 120 words a minute. Thank you. I didn't tell you that, though. That's about it. Uh, a person speaking to a group or a normal conversation, about 120 words a minute. How fast can you listen? I'm going back here. How fast can we listen? As fast as we can read. In, in terms of interpreting and what we're reading, uh, understanding what we're reading. Most professionals, such as yourselves, can read at about 450 to 500 words a minute. Now, using a little math, very little tonight, what's the difference between your listening rate and my speaking rate? Four to one. It could be as much as 300 to 375 words a minute. If we subtract uh, 125 from 500, which most of us can read 500 words a minute, we got 375 words every minute tonight, as you sit here, to play with. And I mean play. In other words, you can toy and, and think about anything but what I'm trying to communicate to you and still look like you're interested. 
right? Or you can call it daydreaming or night dreaming. It's 7 o'clock. You can call it something. But you've got 375 words that you can use without listening. Oh, yes, you can decode. You can, they come in one ear, and as mom used to say, go out the other ear, right? They come in one ear and out the other ear. That's when we're children. Now, as adults, you don't let that happen. I'm told that the, the, the maximum amount of time you can bear with a speaker is about 29 minutes. And here we go about 45 before we take a break. That's not good arithmetic, but we'll take breaks. But the point I'm trying to get through is that you can listen a lot faster than I can speak. So, as somebody's talking to you, what are you doing with the 375? If, if, if you're sincere about it, what, and you're not listening, but you, you're sincerely trying to make this conversation keep going, what are you doing with the 375? Sorry I asked that question. I, <laughs> that's not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> yes. You're thinking about what you are going to say when that person full of crap shuts up, right? <laughs> yes. That's what you're doing. Now, that would be called listening. This gentleman says, you could be thinking about how you can use what you just heard. To me, that's putting some conscious effort onto making that communication happen the way it was intended. If you're trying to think how this person is, is working up here, and we don't get paid. You know, we, we try to think we can do a little bit of good, as uh, our uh, 44 years of teaching has taught us that most of the time, we don't do a whole lot of good, but we keep trying. We keep trying. So, 500 words a minute in your head, 125 coming out of my mouth, 375. How can I use what he's saying? You're doing one thing right now that's the sign of a good listener, most of you. Good listening does require eye contact. How much eye contact are you getting with email? Research, folks, research, professorial research. 130 different emotions can be shown with the human face. 130. How much emotion comes through with electronic message? You can put that little smiley thing in there and hope that people think you're joking when you say something. Doesn't always work, does it? <laughs> okay. I, I'm, not taking, I'm not taking email apart here tonight, am I? I'm just saying that human communicate, the guy next to me at Kent, he would send me an email. His office was this far from mine. All he had to do was walk out. Jeez. Call me, Alan. Come over, say hi. It's easier to do this and hope that I'm going to read it in the next 25 minutes or 25 days. I'm working with somebody now who doesn't like email, doesn't read it. I've got to get used to calling that person on the phone. Too much gadgetry here. Some important facts. Now we get the quiz. See if you've been listening or thinking about your personal communication style. Oh, I know another bumper sticker that I forgot to mention. People comprehend content. Content, they listen to the messenger. They can comprehend content. Yes, email is good and efficient and fast for content if you write it correctly. And you can say exactly how that's going to be received at the other end. But 50 people could get the same messages 48 different ways. Keep that point in mind. Okay. We, we, we listen to people, we comprehend content. Obama is an excellent orator, and we listened. 
Watch his nonverbals. Okay, as we're going through this process called communication, uh, a good manager, good manager, will listen for the facts. Some of you remember Dragnet. Give me the facts, only the facts. Communicators need only to be concerned with facts, factual information. Would you mark that true or false? And I'd like you to take time to put a T or an F after that. And we're going to collect your papers. And you've got to get an 80% to leave tonight. Use pencil, folks. Use pencil. <laughs> Communicators need only to be concerned with the facts. Would you think that's generally true or generally false? <clears throat> Heard a lot of people say false. Good. That's a, that's a plus. That's, that's good. Now, what would we be concerned about besides facts? <clears throat> Emphasis. Opinion, situation. situation, what do all of us human beings have inside of us? We have heart. <laughs> I don't usually use it. <laughs> My voice is, carries pretty well. Um, we have feelings. Uh, you could call it opinions. You could call it uh, a sense and intuition and environment. There's a lot of things besides facts that influence the way that we receive a message. I'll quit doing this in about five minutes, but how much feeling goes into electronic communication? If feelings are important, and you're a parent, or you're a doctor, you want to get the symptoms straight, you want to get us in and out pretty quickly, but we have feelings. All of us have feelings, and, and electronically, we don't get a lot of feeling. We get a lot of facts, OK? Rumors known to be false are not worth listening to. Now you're afraid. See, because false is a good answer, and it's what the book says you should answer to this. But the point is, why? Why would we want to listen to something that we know wasn't true? Amusing. Pardon? Amusing. Possibly. Possibly. Amusing. Amusing. That's right. You could find out what someone else is thinking. And if they take it to another level and they repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, what could happen? Damaging. Becomes damaging because we start to believe that it's true. A false statement becomes a true reality. There's a wonderful uh, movie made many years ago, and they made it into a management uh, training film. I don't know if you've ever saw it. Productivity and the Self-Fulfilling Prophecy. Did you ever hear of it? Did you ever hear My Fair Lady? What happened in My Fair Lady? They start off this movie, uh, the, the, the management movie, by showing what happened in 1929 with the banks. Most of the banks were actually solvent. People thought they weren't. They went, took out their money, and all of a sudden, bang, we have a great bank run. And pretty soon, the economy <coughs> falters, called the Great Depression. But it was, a, it was a rumors. People thought they were true. And they created the reality. Now, My Fair Lady, great movie. You probably don't remember it. But Henry Higgins and that, that flower girl from Great Britain. What did he do? It's exactly right. A silk purse out of a sow's ear. And in fact, that was a message that was actually in the movie, I think, in the statement made a silk purse out of the sow's ear because he believed that she could become a duchess. 
It's a great movie if you've never seen it, My Fair Lady. But that, that's an example at Hollywood style, and the Depression is an example in political and economic style of what can happen when we let rumors that are false seem to be true. I have something here. I suppose some of you use this, especially if you have a weak uh, right hand and you want to play tennis and get your forearm stronger. You've got to get this muscles going pretty well, pretty strong. If you put a, a gauge in here, they, 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 it converts into a dynamometer. In Great Britain, they did some research under hypnosis with one of these things. The, the, the subjects were told under hypnosis that they were weak. The dynamometer read, on average, 29 pounds. They were told under hypnosis, the same people, that they were strong. The, the, the squeeze went up to something about 44 pounds. Under normal conditions, no hypnosis, they were in the 30s. And what the researchers showed is that people can do more than they think they can do if they believe they can do it. And my fair lady, the whole point of that movie was, I, that guy's making me believe that I can do this, that I can speak, that I can dance the waltz in a, in a, in a, like a duchess would. It's a beautiful, beautiful film, I think, in terms of it explains a lot about this question. If you believe in yourself and your leader or your manager can make you believe that you can do even better, you will. Now, good leadership trusts people to do better than they think they can do. Um, I don't know if this is what you wanted to hear tonight, but if you've got children, by all means, don't stop at what they're doing now. Work with them. Work with them. They can probably do more than they think they can do if they have support from the parents. Questions? Comments? In dealing with the rumor, then, your point is to ask two questions of the other person that's spreading the rumor. What do you mean by it? And how do you know? Where did it come from? Sound like FBI man. Are you FBI man? <laughs> Pardon? Oh. Can I tell him? No? He was a policeman. What do you mean, and how do you know? OK, so rumors need to be corrected, or, or over a period of time, they can become reality. And that's the whole point of this issue. Silence is golden. I mean, you're all silent. You're all looking. You've got eye contact. You're, you're, you're not sleeping, at least with your eyes open. What, what silence is great? Silence is golden. Silence should be interpreted and accepted as agreement. False. You're catching on here. They're all false. <laughs> no. What, what is it about certain people that make them or cause them not to want to speak out? Introverted. 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 Personality. They could be angry. They're thinking. Lord knows we need more of that. They're what? They're not listening. Is that you? Just afraid. Afraid, fear, makes people keep quiet. The boss is a tyrant, dictator. Who's going to tell the emperor? He has no clothes. Oh, not me, boss. No, I need my paycheck. So many bosses are so happy because nobody's complaining. 
God, they ought to have some complaints every now and then. They ought to have people willing to stand up and say, boss, I think we ought to look at this in a different way. Leaders will do that. Leaders will want to hear what's on their people's minds. Managers generally don't want that kind of stuff coming at them because they've got enough problems. They don't want to see Charlie coming because Charlie's always got another problem. Well, if Charlie stops coming, you better worry because some of those problems are real. So don't accept the fact that silence, it, it, it means they agree with you. Okay, on that one? In a meeting? If you happen to be a boss? How do you get everyone to speak out at a meeting? Any bosses here? I'm managers here in the room? Call them. But they're afraid, you said. Oh, we'd like to hear from you. Oh. Ask them. Put them under pressure. Right. That relationship is critical, isn't it? You said proper relationship. And that trust and honesty and all that. Yes, the trust. They trust you not to jump down their throat if they bring you a problem. You don't get fired. Right. But what do we do with the introverts? We hear a lot of times from the so-called squeaky wheels, don't we? The people that are always talking. And we don't hear from some of the people that are probably extremely intelligent, have much to offer. They just don't offer it. How do we draw these people out without pointing and say, what do you think? And what do you think? Post it notes. Yes? Have everybody write down, just take five minutes and write down everything you want to talk about on post it notes and then just put a big pile up front. Storyboarding, yeah. so to speak, post it notes. You can arrange them, you can put them up, you can say, here's what. You don't identify anybody, you identify the issues. So you send out the agenda of the meeting in advance. Excellent idea. I hope all of you that have meetings get the agenda out by, by email in advance of the meeting so people have a chance to think of what's going to be on the meeting. Put a couple questions on there. Use post-it notes. Uh, I don't know if anyone have ever heard of something called the nominal group process. Nominal group. Nameless group. <laughs> we just want, we want to know what's on your mind. We don't. Just go around the group. Everybody offers some ideas about this problem, and everybody's going to participate. Nobody gets scared. It works. It's on the internet if you want to check it out. It's a wonderful meeting tool. Uh, it, nominal meeting, almost nameless. We, we don't want the names attached to the ideas. It, the post-it notes, I guess, would be, would be even uh, a nicer way. We could do it right while they're sitting there. I was at a meeting at Ron Marhoffer's, and, and Ron has a technique in his meetings that he has three different, different color flags. And there's a red flag for, wait a minute, we better stop and look at this, a yellow flag saying, that's caution, and a green flag saying, let's go with it. So he would use nonverbal signals to get people's, to get an idea of where people were at on something he wanted to do. Uh, he was a guest speaker in my classes for many years, and he would even, he told us that he gave the, Every employee got a key to the building. I trust you folks, here's a key. That trust was shown by a very visual, simple sign. Here's, here's a key to my building, our building, he said. Effective communication fills several human needs. Would you call that true or false? All right, that's the right answer. <laughs> Say they're not all false. OK. Now, here, here we're going to do something that you've all done probably four times if you've went or taken a course in business. You've seen this before. It'll come up later, but I want to do it right now because I think it's more appropriate to do it now. I, I'm drawing a, 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 a triangle here. I'm going to put five lines here.
What is it? Thank you. You happen to, happen to have heard this too many times in your corporate meetings and so forth. But when we say communication fills several important needs, here we have the physical needs. It really takes money to buy food and drink and, and housing and all that stuff. But once people get enough money, uh, to hopefully, to solve those physiological needs, they move up to a need for security. Then what? For those of you that have ha heard it a lot before, then what comes after a sense of security? We have social needs. Call it belonging, call it love, but it's social. And then, once we see we're part of a team, we belong to the organization, we're part of a family, we have another level up here, a little bit higher. All of us have one. Ego. Self-esteem. You could say ego, it's easier to write ego than it is all that other stuff. Self-esteem. I want to know that I'm doing something that's valuable to somebody else. I want to be recognized and given credit for my work that I'm doing. Please, boss, let me hear from you every now and then when I do something right. Don't always come after me when I've done something wrong. That's, don't, that's a need. And each one of these three can be dealt with with good, solid, effective communication. I give credit and appreciation for work that's done well. I let you know what's going on in the organization, and I tell you what's expected of you so you feel more secure in, in working here. Notice that I'm kind of talking at an audience that <laughs> has some managers in it, but that's the way my language kind of goes sometimes. But good managers who are good leaders think about communication as filling significant human needs. Now, let's say that you're a bad boss. You're not a leader. You don't communicate. What happens to those needs? They break down. They break down. And if they break down badly enough, the person either quits or causes problems at work because they are very frustrated. Yes, the absence of need satisfaction leads to frustrated people. This is all tying together, I hope, at some point, that you can understand it's not all <coughs> crap. <laughs> he, he, he said, uh, you know, it's, it's, yes. Did you want to say? Yeah, I think even uh, worse than uh, creating problems, becoming indifferent, uh, with employee just basically shows up to fulfill whatever minimal obligation there is to be paid and doesn't really see themselves as He says that they just show up. They do the minimum because they need the. Does this motivate? What goes in here? Does it motivate? I have a, a business partner who, who I work with, and, and he says it gets him in the door. That's all it does. Money gets you in the door. And once you're in the door, you can keep your job. And the research indicates if you work at 20% of your, your capability, 20%. Effective leadership and good management, dealing with human needs, gets a person to come to work for more than just the wallet. And some of you will know, I think, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, my wife was a substitute teacher at the Weaver School for about 11 years. And uh, they'd call very early in the morning. She had a certificate from Kent State. That's two. Uh, uh, dealing with a severely, profoundly retarded children after an, a master's in education. She's got that extra certificate. 
She liked the, working with the children. She'd go and she'd come, she'd go and she'd come. We'd talk and we'd talk. Well, mainstreaming kind of got in the way back in the 80s and uh, pretty soon the children left in the Weaver School sometimes weren't always the kind that, that maybe <coughs> should have been there. So what happened? One day, Mrs. Smith saw this child running down 91 without any clothes on. She went out, she got a blanket, she got the child back into the Weaver School, took, him, took the child and, and did something that, that kept anything from getting out of control any more than it was. Up steps the post-it note that stayed on our refrigerator for about seven years. A thank you from the principal who saw everything happening and said, Miss Smith, you handled that very well. That was the only word that this substitute teacher heard in 11 years that had anything positive about it. But it took a pretty important event to cause that to happen. And she was so proud that the principal took the time out to write a little post it note saying, thank you, Mrs. Smith, for handling that situation. That was all that she ever heard from the people at the top. Just a substitute teacher. Don't really matter too much. You're not full time. You're definitely not union. So why bother? Well, little things make a big difference when it comes to people's self-esteem. I'll never forget that post-it note. I think by now it's gone and probably forgotten by everybody except me. But the idea was that it, it was a, wasn't a bonus. It wasn't a paycheck. It wasn't money. It was giving credit for something that was done right. So you folks, you parents especially, you can use psychology with children. You can use it with your spouse. When your spouse cooks you a good dinner, don't say, oh, it's not hot. I wish it were hotter. Thank you, thank you for making the dinner. It was very good. Remember, credit for an appreciation for work that's done is important to people. It fills a significant human need, and I'm lecturing too much. I think, before we go any further on this quiz, we ought to take a 10-minute break. Stretch them out. There's some water back there. I don't see any beer, but uh, we don't have time to go to the bar next door. Just take 10 minutes, stretch up, go out. So we all agreed that people that are silent aren't necessarily happy with what we're saying, which I found out during the break. <laughs> OK, we got people in our workforce, our friends and our families that have personal issues. Let's just go back to work for a moment. It doesn't do much good to just to listen to people's personal problems, does it? Just listening? Yes, yes. I think you're right, and you're right in terms of this particular question. The rightness isn't as important as you understand what the message is trying to deliver to you. Listening to personal problems is important, uh, but unfortunately, a boss thinks they have to solve the problem. That's the worst thing that a manager can get into is solving the personal problems of employees. Listening, though, showing that you care, it sounds a little bit, what? fluffy duffy, but it's so important that somebody at work will take the time to listen. So, yes, and, and you don't have to solve problems as long as you can say, oh, I, I think the worst thing you can say, I know just how you feel because you can't know how they feel. That's, I think that's a common comeback or, gee, I had that same problem last week and uh, no, that's not that's not what they want to hear from you. People who say less usually have less to offer. That goes back to that silent thing where we, we know that there are people that are very intelligent. They have a lot to offer. But for some reason, as uh, was pointed out, they're afraid. Uh, they're introvertish. They just don't want to take a chance. So don't assume that people that don't communicate with you don't have anything to offer. Many times they have more to offer than those squeaky wheels. Yes, sir.
I didn't think anybody cared. The arm. No, those aren't any good. Those don't write. I had a blue one that really was good. If I had the right pen, I would put up here SF, self-fulfillment. It's what the Army used to say. How did you find that? <laughs> Must have rolled on the floor or something. Thank you. This is self-actualization or self-fulfillment. This is exactly what I was looking for. And uh, it's the Maslow's high, uh, highest level of need. And his claim, although it's never been proven, was that only about 10% of the people ever realize they have that need. And these, these were the keys for communication. This was uh, what the Army used to say, become all you're capable of becoming. I think they were playing off that, that, that level of Maslow's hierarchy. Remember that ad that they used to put on, become all that you're capable of becoming. And I think I, every time I heard that, I said, that's Maslow. Thank you for asking. I'm really glad you were awake, yes? Did I do that again? Uh, back to your school days. A person who knows a subject well communicates it well. You're becoming an issue. <laughs> You're going to get a <laughs> we'll have a chat at 10 o'clock tonight, OK? And it's just about this. It's just the way you decoded what he was saying. Yes. Um, if you think back to your school days, uh, uh, most of you did spend a little time in college, I would guess. Some of the worst teachers that I ever had could never come down to my level but they were intelligent, they, they knew so much. They just knew it too well for me. And sometimes I think managers especially are so imbued with their technical competence that they expect everybody else to know as much as they do. And they don't. And therein lies the Peter Principle. You all know about that one? We rise to that level where we're no longer competent. We're promoted on our basis of our technical knowledge. You take your best welder and make him a foreman. Uh-uh. Not necessarily that best welder is going to be the best foreman. There's something in supervision and management goes beyond being technically solid. And no matter how well they can know the subject, they have difficult teaching it to somebody else. You found another one, thank you. <laughs> These folks at the library, they are so courteous and gracious and helpful. Oh, gosh. It's a great library, folks. Visit, visit often. Those books are uh, put out, they're, they're brand new issues, and I was told that they're available for checking out tonight if you wish. If you see something that you like there, they'll check them out for you. And they just, I think they just came in this week or something? Yeah. Uh, today, now that's hot off the press, or a Federal Express truck. If a person's feelings are hurt, you've done a poor job communicating. Is anybody named Charlie here? I picked that name off random, I don't want to insult anybody, but Charlie comes in, hasn't been on time for four days in a row, and you're saying, Charlie, I got to write you up. One more day late, and you're got to go home and think about it. I'll give you a day off. Charlie, oh my gosh, I worked here for 32 years. Nobody ever told me about coming in late. This new boss is something else. I don't feel good about him, her. You got to communicate sometimes, folks, things that have to be communicated. Um, I have another bumper sticker for you. You might want to write this one down. I think this has got a lot of wisdom in it. What we allow, we teach. It's only five words, but there's a lot of, uh, I think, wisdom, whoever came up with that. It wasn't I. But what we allow, we teach. Think about it. 
Charlie comes in late, we allow it to happen, comes in again late, allow it to happen, the other employees are watching, Charlie says, oh, I can do it, I've been here 32 years, nobody ever said anything. Sorry, Charlie, we've got a policy here, showing up on time. Work starts at 8 o'clock, not 8.15. Charlie says, oh my goodness, I am so hurt. Important communication is either written or verbal. Who said true? <laughs> Written or verbal now. There, there is something in the, again, the research that suggests that <clears throat> seven to 10% of our communication occurs with words that are either written or verbal, and uh, the rest is nonverbal. Now, as I was thinking about tonight's class, I, I, I thought what was on here, and I thought what I wanted to say was not on here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. IBM did a study, the voice, the voice transmits 50 bits per second, the ear, transmits a thousand bits per second, picks up a thousand bit. The eye can pick up 350 million bits per second. Now this is the IBM research and I guess that's kind of what, what we had shown to us. Gestures, illustrations, tone of voice. This sentence here I had written down, the boss is giving Sheila a promotion? 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 You got one sentence and with four different intonations, you can convert or convey four different meanings to that one sentence just by your tone of voice. Pardon? Yes, tone of voice, yes, thank you. And I hope I didn't insult you. I was just trying to play a game up front and I needed somebody to say true and, okay. A, a big company down the road that builds tires, uh, they built, see I don't work there anymore so I can say this, <laughs> no. Uh, a company built a new research center and it had a parking garage. And the vice president back then said, we're all equal, we're all associates, everybody's equal. But the vice president's got to park in the garage and the employees got to park out in the back 40. And they, they were coming to me as one of their teachers saying, oh, there's something wrong here. There's a disconnect between what they're saying and, and what they're doing. They took the garage, we get the rain and snow out there in the back 40, okay. A different company. Policy came out, there's no pictures will be hung on the wall. Employees took that to mean individualism was to be downplayed, that everyone was to be part of one big group. No room for innovation or no room for being different. I happened to be in a meeting with this person, it was an executive, who put out the policy and I mentioned it. His quote to me in front of others was, I just wanted to get that 50-year-old crud off the walls. Family pictures would be fine, he said. So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily what you say sometimes, it's what you do that makes a difference. I hope so. I, I hope that as the evening wears on, and I say wear <laughs> carefully, but as the, as the evening goes on, I know if you all had a long day at work, or some of you did and you're tired, but yes, I think we have to be careful to not mix efficiency with effectiveness. Eye contact accompanying a message causes that message to be received more favorably. Leaning forward, 
when somebody's speaking. It shows interest. Crossing your legs and folding your arms. That's, that's a nonverbal. It says, you know, you, you can do so many things with your body and your eyes and your feet and your legs to convey messages that you're probably not even aware of, nor am I, standing up in front of you. Videotaping would be great. I should watch that videotape. Yes, sir. Oh, you're just touching this. I, you're, I, I thought you were asking a question. Standing erect, self-confidence, stooping, poor self-image. Distance, 18 inches, intimate, four to eight feet, social. More than 12 feet, public. Body language, frown, smile, raise your eyebrows, narrow eyes, pursed lips, biting up. There's, there's pages and pages of things that we do that, that we don't know or take much attention to, but you watched Mr. Obama when he speaks. Watch his body language. His eyes are moving to the audience. His smile is, is charismatic. He points with his hands. He's done everything to convey confidence, uh, happiness, uh, you just watch. He, he's going to be in history, as Reagan was, a great orator. Ronald, was, Ronald Reagan was called a great communicator. Of course, he had years of practice, years of practice in the radio and television and in the movies. This uh, article from the uh, Dallas uh, Associated Press, woman dies while son tries to get an ambulance. The dispatcher, the, the, the son, was so excited and so frustrated that he swore at the dispatcher, used foul language. She never put the message through to the ambulance till the kid says after eight minutes, my mom's dead. Forget the ambulance. That, that kind of stuff can, can really have tragic, nonverbals can have tragic Im implications. You think communications are good? I don't know what they want from me. They never told me. Job descriptions are a thing of the past, aren't they? Who has time to write one or, more importantly, sometimes update it? People don't understand what the instructions are, and they're afraid to tell that, that we don't understand. Teachers are notorious. We talk a lot, we know a lot, we think we know a lot, and, it's, and the student will not ask questions for many reasons until they write a quiz and they say, they never understood it. The same questions being asked frequently over time, uh, repeating the job over again, important things aren't getting done, quality going down, motivation and productivity are low. Boy, anybody have that at work? No, don't put your hand up. Don't. Your boss might be watching. Some of these things are, are, are in organizations today, and the reasons that these organizations are, are falling flat on their face. I do, but I'd rather have somebody or some people from the audience suggest a company that they felt. Yes, ma'am.
And, and 40 is bad? Oh, really? Wow. You reminded me I ran off that nonverbal so fast. Maybe somebody else has an example they would like to share. Thank you for sharing. I wish you had a more positive example, but. Uh, Turning you down, she meant. Wait, wait, wait. We'll go. We'll get to it. Any other nonverbal examples like this one? This is, you know, very important to me. I don't know if it's important to you, but. Nonverbal is so critical anymore. No more examples? Okay, when your chin hits the table at 8 o'clock, I'll know that nonverbal says something to me. Good companies, good companies, companies that are smaller to mid sized, that are really doing a lot of the things that we're suggesting ought to be done. Show of hands, so I can ask you a little bit. No good companies in this room, represented in the room? Yes. I, I just want to make a comment that I think the state of the economy answers that question. I, don't, I believe there are not very many companies that actually follow these principles. But they you know the economy, is, like computers, are being used too much as an excuse for yeah. things going bad. There are good companies out there. I, I, I do well, see I some. That's big, though. We're, we're, we're looking for something smaller. We have the, the company, you know which one I'm thinking of, that are able to find a niche, and they are now selling to Mexico, selling to China, yep. their particular product. But they can make it better and lower cost. Thank you. It sounds like they're profitable too, very profitable, and they're local. Um, did you have one? A company in mind? No. Yeah. Anyone else? They have another 40 people in the Hudson. The 
call out those four people. You have 10 percent. That's how you grow a business. It, it's the opportunity, half like the class, half full, half empty. Back in 80, in the early 80s, I, I really wasn't. I had a business plan. I really wasn't aware of a recession because it didn't affect me. If it doesn't affect you, then you're not. You know, 90 percent of the people that have a job and they're doing well. They don't have to about recession. Uh, but the point is, is that. Uh, a lot of jobs is a, and I, I don't know what the, I found something on the internet that I uh, discovered about the top 10 most successful businesses of, eight, of, of 2008, the most profitable, et cetera. And one of the most profitable was a collection agency down in Florida, you know, <laughs> that blew the, you know, blew the wheels off of hardly everybody else. This was, a, she was a, a realtor, okay? She was in it all her life, started this thing two years ago down in the Oak Ridge Commons. You know, and now I, I talked to her a couple of months ago. She, she's got offers around the world of people who want to buy her business. Now she's not, she's doing something that a lot of other companies are doing, but she figured out how to do it a little differently, but she wouldn't tell me. <laughs> okay, uh, to make it that successful. But obviously she took what she had, you know, and everybody has a lot of experiences. She took an existing product and demand for it. And like I said before, I, you know, I don't, I said, hey, if the real estate market turns around, what are you going to do? And she laughed at me, you know, kind of indicated that, you know, uh, out of, you know, London, she made lemonade with it. Maybe she hired hit man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, something right. But that's <laughs> Well, that's, that's an excellent example. You, you, you saw a person that was creative and found a way to exploit a market that was there, and nobody else was doing it. or you make an excellent product, like Handel's ice cream. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. They, people line up to get that product that everybody Andy, else is making. And Ames Pencil. You know how Ben and Jerry started their business? Those guys are kind of, you know, up in New England. You know how they got their formula? They, they, they were in Pueblo, Colorado, pardon the French, and they went to the United States government with the, and they took that formula that the government says how to make ice cream, and that's their formula. It's what the government gave them free of charge out of Colorado. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I didn't mean to imply there were no companies in the world that followed it, but I, I think the, the topic that you're talking about tonight, I, I believe it's obvious, it's obvious to me that the reason, I think part of the reason that we're in the trouble that we are is that companies don't think about what you're talking about at all. A lot of companies, the majority of companies, do not think about it. They are traditional. They, it worked last year. It's going to work this year. When the planes crashed, Harris Publishing in Kingsburg was bought by the Bridge. And one of the things that I thought was phenomenal that they did there that I'll probably never find anywhere else, I guarantee, is they had their employees sit down and write down things that they thought they did well at and things that they needed to improve on. And they made that part of raises and uh, salary increases and stuff like that. They had you actually look at yourself. Nobody wants to look at what's not good about yourself. And improve it. And I think that that made me excel like off the charts. By writing down what you were good at and what you needed improvement. Well, the process that we did for five years, for five of the six years that I worked for them. So instead of them giving you an evaluation, they ask you to evaluate yourself. Oh. So they were looking for performance increases and that type of thing. It was a done at risk process that they brought to us. And they I just, I, they, I, mean, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the 20% people get. That increases that a lot. <coughs> there are bright spots on the horizon, folks. A good friend of mine is president of a mold company in Twinsburg. And, uh, Little Tykes in step one took their molds to China, got them for maybe half price. And about uh, eight months later, they came back 
they didn't run. They, they couldn't run anywhere near the number of parts off those molds that we made right here in Twinsburg, Ohio. There are companies around that are doing good work, and the Chinese can't hold a candle to them. So, you know, we think things are going down, but we, we can find bright spots. We just have to look for them. You know, your attitude determines your altitude. That, that's another one that I heard somebody say the other day. Good attitudes help a lot when you're in the business of managing and leading other people. Your, atti your attitude makes. Why'd you have to bring up that guy? Okay. 435 employers, this is for all you folks that would be looking for a, a job, surveyed by the National Association of College and Employer Institute of some sort. 435 employers said that communication skills and self-motivation top the list of what they're looking for in their employees, the ones that they interview. Communication skill, Toastmasters, debating teams, public speaking, that all goes a long way in helping your resume shine from, from all the others. And um, don't, don't discount. We don't meet our schedule dates. Um, we've already gone through this, the downside of email. Remember, it's one way. Feedback is often lacking. You have no idea whether the person is interpreting that message the way you are sending it. Communication is a, no, a six-stage process. Thinking, encoding, transmitting, decoding, interpreting. Five stages there, and any stage, noise can enter the system. So keep in mind, when you write your email, think about it before you send it, because it's going to go out there at the speed of light, and you can't call it back. Once it's in, in that user's mailbox, that, that's the way it's going to be. The downside of email, any others that you can think of? Any examples? Leaving out a single word, misspellings. Have a very good friend working at the university, has a management position, types very fast, and types with a lot of misspelled words and doesn't use spell check. Spell checks don't always work either, but never use a spell check. And that gives me a bad impression of that person's thoughtfulness in, in terms of sending a message out to a lot of people. Misspelling. So yeah, that sounds like 1920, doesn't it? <laughs> Who thought of spelling as being important? But emails should be spelled correctly. FaceTime has power. <clears throat> the Moravian Experiments, if you check that name, it's a long and fa fancy sounding name. He appears in Google uh, over and over again, even though his research was begun back in the 1970s. He says, and his research seems to indicate that only up to 10 percent or 7 to 10 percent of the, of the message is, is, is verbal. And, and so much more is, is, has to do with things that aren't verbal or written. Are you a good listener? Do you fake it tonight and other times? Do you act polite when you really don't want to? Are you reacting many times to words that are emotional? You turn out on topics that you're not interested in, easy to do. Daydream, that's that 375 a minute you got to daydream. Oh. happened to me just today. Somebody brought me some bad news and I got a little bit uptight about it and said, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you the message. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, you know, it's easy to, to jump to conclusions. It's easy to get upset with the message you're getting if you don't stop and think about your emotions. Jumping to conclusions. Don't like the way he dresses. You judge me, old professor, has nothing to do with the message I'm trying to deliver. Well, you're just an old college professor. Ah, 
It was a great life. And it still is. Thinking of what you wish to say next. And then there's that latter approach. I think it's in your notes, which bothers me somewhat about giving out the notes in advance because you don't pay much attention to what pops in. Uh, looking at the person. Ironically, that's the first letter of the word ladder. Asking questions. Some of you ask questions tonight. Oh, it's so helpful when you do that. <laughs> there I go again. Um, don't change the subject. Don't interrupt. That's why teachers in the second grade taught us this, and why us professors always enjoyed seeing somebody that wanted to be recognized. I don't know why, it's just an old habit of mine. It's, it's nice when you know that a person wants to say something, you know who wants to say it. Otherwise, things get a little bit chaotic. Empathize, empathize not sympathize, empathize with the speaker. <clears throat> the old expression, put yourself in a person's shoes that's speaking. Until you walk in their shoes, it's pretty hard to say that I know just how you feel. When somebody tells you about their son becoming a drug addict, oh, I know just how you feel. No, you don't. <laughs> Your son hasn't one of those. Respond verbally and non-verbally. That's the latter approach to good listening. We talked about listening as a skill. We don't teach it. We don't think about it. We think it's natural. We do it every day. We teach people how to read and write, but we don't teach them about listening. It's OK. A little bit now about this topic called motivation. It's good. It certainly influences how we perform. There's not a whole lot of it out there some days. And it's a tool that managers can use. And we go back to Maslow. People will work towards a goal when they have an unsatisfied need. And they'll go to satisfy that need. Then unfortunately, they go to higher levels or they'll revert back. It's, it's not an easy thing to explain or it's not an easy thing to understand or do research in. But motivation is good. It's out there. And we can improve it with good leadership skill and communications. I, I'm going to check what page you're on here for a very special reason. OK, don't turn the page. Why do people prefer recreation over work? Might be. Can you pull vault over nine foot? Did you ever play golf in a foursome? <laughs> Hit a bad two, you were evaluated. OK, yeah. There's something about evaluation. There's something about ease. What else is involved in recreation? Let's take um, what the one minute manager did. And there's a book here about the one minute manager. Um, the guy that wrote it talked about a lot of good examples in there. And uh, one of them was about bowling. And uh, I thought about bowling. And, and this is, looks like about long enough for an alley here. And I don't have a ball or, nor, or there are any pins. Would you bowl without pins? You know, you could have a nice ball, and you could lay it down and throw it out, and you say, oh, that looked just like a strike. But there's no pins. There's no feedback. feedback, that magic word of feedback. There's no feedback. Did you get 9? Did you get 10? Did you get 11? In the book he's talking about, or is it a CD? He talks about a manager who will set up pins and then put a sheet down over it, you know, one of these big sheets. So you can't see the pins, but you know they're there. You throw the ball. You hear some crash, and you don't know whether it's a strike. You don't know whether it's a split. You don't know how to shoot the next ball. And then from behind the sheet, he goes like this. You got two of them. Which two? Or is that the two that are down or the two that are up? That, that's, a, that's a book worth reading. It's been around for a long time, and the guy that wrote it is still doing a, a lot of good things out there. But would you bowl without pins? Would you golf without a, without a 
a hole in the middle of the green or somewhere in the green. What, what, what are the pins? What, what does that, that, that flag represent? What is a, a net in tennis? What, what happens in recreation that makes us want to play? Goals. We have goals. We have something to shoot for, and we know when we've hit it. And in golf, you'll have a par. And if you get a bird or a bogey or something, you know that you're a little over or you're a little under. You can feel good about yourself. And you can improve your performance with practice. It's an excellent book. I, I recommend it highly. What, is that a CD? or yes. Double CD. Ken Blanchard has teamed up now with Spencer Johnson called The One Minute Manager. And you can check it out if you wish. But that, that's something that now it's on video, it might be even better than the book was. What else about recreation is, is kind of motivational? You know the rules, and they don't change. You know, we, we hear a lot about change these days, but when you're playing a sport, you don't want them to say, well, 11 yards for a first down. No, it's 10 yards for a first down. You don't want the basket to go to 11 feet up instead of 10 feet. No, the rules don't change. Well, change is important in some respects, but not, not in certain areas. What else is it about recreation? There's a defined ending point. There's a start and finish. There's a start and there's a finish. It's either time or All right. Okay. Uh, the rules are the same for everyone. And they don't change unless there's a big NCAA edict that says there'll be a change. So the rules don't change, and everybody plays by the same rules, level playing field. What about choice? You're doing something you want to because of these other features. Why we prefer recreation over work. I taught MBA for years, and at the end of every course, I asked the students, what do you want to take away from this class? This is one thing that came up over and over from the students. We never thought about why people prefer recreation to work. Now, there's something else about recreation. It goes back to what we said earlier this evening about delegation versus empowerment. Delegation versus empowerment. There is a reward, and that's make breaking par, but there's a choice. You do it because you want to, but can't, OK. When you Yes. There is some, something to be said for choosing something that you know you can do. Not necessarily you don't have to be perfect at it, but you know you can handle it. And you enjoy doing it. It's easy to track your progress almost every step of the way. Yes. And if you increase your effort, you may increase your performance. And you get to modify the way you approach whatever it is you're doing. You get immediate feedback from the results of that. So you're self-empowered. Get immediate feedback. You can alter what you do. You can increase your effort. You can practice. You can get better at it. You, you, you get a lot of things out of recreation that, unfortunately, you can never get out of work. False. False. Thank you. Somebody said, thank you. That's totally false. What can you do to design jobs so that you can bring some of this recreational qualities into the work environment, folks? Why did the MBA students like that particular presentation? Because they can see, even though it's going to take some creative thinking, how to adjust the job environment to make it a little bit more recreational, like spinning that wheel, working in a team, putting up some things on the board, showing people's performance. First here. 
That was the other thing that they did there is we had um, tug of war, we had all kinds of like different activities that engaged the employees with the employers and brought a team together, team unity. It was a very family oriented business. All those elements really wanted to make you go and do a good job at your job. Because you look forward to going for more than the money. It was challenging and had a lot of aspects that most jobs today don't have. Because? Nobody's creative lack enough. Creativity. Lack of creativity. Yes. I just said goals. I mean, you know, you said there's no goals. Right. No. There are no pins. Right. You have no idea when you go to work. Am I doing anything you like, Box? You're not telling me. Yeah. You might hold up a two, but I don't know which two. <laughs> I don't know which two pins are up there or which knocked down. Uh, okay. That, that's enough of that, I think. Earlier on, I said that current effort can hold your job. That's not what I wanted. Current effort here, 20% of your effort and your capability will keep your job for you. Nobody really works at 100% all the time. But all this room in here is a potential for managers using leadership skills to influence the performance of people. I can show up and get paid here. Management can move me around here. There's that thing again. See, self-actualization was at the top. I didn't want to uh, go into it where I had to show you everything all at one time. I, I wanted to kind of build that model in front of you, and my drawing wasn't very visible. The typical person's degree of needs satisfaction Physiological, we're up to 85%. As we go up that hierarchy, it's less and less and less. And, and right here, in my opinion, is where we need a lot of help in our society. And that's where the leader comes in. The inspirational leader will play off your self-esteem. If you don't know the job, he'll help you learn the job. If you do the job, he'll let you know you're doing a job, that you're knocking down the pins. And he'll help you set some more pins up. That's, that's a, a, a job in itself. Managing, remember, we, we manage things, we lead people. And I think what happens too often is managers are so busy with the bottom line profitability and stuff, they don't remember or do they care much about psychology. This is psychology in here. And that's what I didn't want you to look at. The goals are more clearly defined. The scorekeeping is more objective, and it's clear when you do score. You can change your performance. It's easy to compare against some standard. In, in golf, we have par. In basketball, we have goals. And in football and tennis and all kinds of recreation, there's something of a standard that we work towards. Feedback is more personal and accurate. Participants have a higher degree of choice regarding the type of reward. The rules of the game don't change. Everyone plays by the same rules. Effort and performance is clear. OK. I'd like to thank you very much for attending. Take one of those books with you tonight.